As the 17th century came to a close, a long period of clashes between the Spanish and French over the island we now know as the home of Haiti and the Dominican Republic finally ended in a solution. The Spaniards made the strategic decision to hand over the western portion of the islands to the French, birthing contemporary Haiti, known then by the French as Saint-Domingue. This newfound French colony quickly built an economy heavily reliant on sugar plantations and thus slavery. By the 18th century, not only were there more slaves sent to Saint-Domingue than anywhere else other than Brazil, but the sheer number of enslaved individuals was nearing 90% of the colony's population. To no surprise, however, numbers didn't mean much when a social hierarchy such as the one in Saint-Domingue was in place. The island hosted a society split into four main categories. The lowest on the totem pole was expectedly the vast population of slaves. Above them were poor white colonists, also known as the Petit Blancs. These were the uneducated artisans and laborers who just so happened to be white, putting them a step above the slaves, but still, in many cases, a step below the wealthy, free people of color. This third social group accounted for nearly 25,000 people at the end of the 18th century as compared to about 30,000 whites. These rich folk often served in militias, and some even owned their own plantations and slaves, which isn't all that surprising when considering that they were generally the children or descendants of plantation owners. And finally, at the top of the social roster, were those white plantation owners, also known as the Grand Blancs. Their role was fairly self-explanatory, and though such a small part of the population, they essentially ran it. Nevertheless, no one quite sums up the social climate in Saint-Domingue, quite like the French historian Paul Fragosi. Whites, mulattoes, and blacks loathed each other. The poor whites couldn't stand the rich whites. The rich whites despised the poor whites. The middle-class whites were jealous of the aristocratic whites. The whites born in France looked down upon the locally born whites. Mulattoes envied the whites, despised the blacks, and were despised by the whites. Free blacks brutalized those who were still slaves. Haitian-born blacks regarded those from Africa as savages. Everyone, quite rightly, lived in terror of everyone else. Haiti was hell, but Haiti was rich. Haiti was, in fact, notably rich, something that would prove crucial in instigating later unrest. In fact, it was the most profitable colony in the entire Caribbean and French colonial empire. Which, speaking of the empire, it was the events of the French Revolution and the formation of the French First Republic that really stirred the pot in Saint-Domingue. Over in France, on August 26, 1789, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen was published. For the French Caribbean colony, this document mostly just caused confusion. The National Constituent Assembly had failed to clarify whether the rights would apply to slaves colonial citizens, or even women for that matter. These issues of the French Revolution quickly leaked over into Saint-Domingue, and this sparked a new wave of racial and societal tensions. The white citizens of the colony were concerned by the declaration as they were focused on maintaining their power and authority, and it thus created a new push for colonial independence among the blanks. Contrarily, the slaves and their free allies saw a need to now demand equality and rights for themselves, particularly without allowing their masters to win independence for Saint-Domingue. So, as anger amplified and disputes arose, the revolution began to stir. On August 21st, 1791, a slave revolt broke out in the colony as thousands of slaves began to murder their master that night following an ominous vodou ceremony. Saint-Domingue was plunged into violent chaos as this rebellion spread rapidly, despite the Blancs having expected some type of revolt to happen in the coming weeks. 
The slaves were quick to start taking territories over piece by piece in spite of any preparation made by the Blancs, and the brutality of the growing civil war reached new heights in short time. Over 100 sugar plantations would be destroyed in the next couple of months, and roughly 4,000 slave owners metaphorically went up in flames with them. Nearly a thousand coffee plantations, another significant source of the colony's economy, were also leveled by the rebellious slaves as the Blancs scrambled to come together and form an organized defense. As the insurgency continued, the National Assembly finally realized that it was time to act. The slaves had been seizing large chunks of the colony, and the death toll on both sides was rising in the thousands. Since the rebels had claimed that they were fighting for their rights as Frenchmen, not for Haitian independence, the assembly decided in the spring of 1792 to grant civil and political rights to all free men, including those of color, hoping that this would calm the rebellion. The backup plan, of course, was a few thousand French troops sent to the colony. The following year would see France's backup plan become exceedingly necessary, as the small-scale revolt had now transformed into war with both Britain and Spain. The latter already controlled the neighboring portion of the island, and thus had reason to get involved in the debacle, though selfishly, Spain supported the rebels for their own gain. They hoped to weaken the French, and thus provided ammunition, supplies, and even tactical advice for the slaves. But so did the British. For Britain, the motive was too an opposition to the French, but also potential monetary gain from France's most lucrative colony. Neither Britain nor Spain actually cared much about the slaves themselves or their cause, but the support they gave the rebels, nevertheless, had France near its knees. Something had to be done. France's answer was based on the goal of securing Saint-Domingue and shaking off the Brits and the Spaniards. Thus, in early 1794, a decree was passed announcing that slavery of the blacks is abolished in all the colonies. Consequently, it decrees that all men living in the colonies without distinction of color, are French citizens and enjoy all the rights guaranteed by the Constitution. This was a shocking move for everyone in the geographical and political audience, but France was convinced that it would be their only way to retain their portion of the island. And for now, it worked. Unfortunately for the French, however, such victories are often short-lived. Tensions may have calmed quite a bit, but the idea of Haitian independence had never fully been erased from imagination. And a certain man by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte was about to bring the concept back to the forefront. Saint-Domingue post-phase one of the revolution saw one of the rebellion's leaders, Toussaint Louverture, consolidate authority and steer the colony in the direction of growing autonomy. Louverture furthermore issued a new constitution for Saint-Domingue in 1801, which declared him governor for life and decreed the establishment of a new autonomous black state. This triggered a strong response from the new leader over in France. Napoleon sent a significant expeditionary force under his brother-in-law Charles Leclerc to handle the situation in their colony. Though many believe this was also related to Bonaparte's ambitions in North America, which required an increase in revenue that could be found on the Haitian island. Either way, Leclerc and his men were on their way to Saint-Domingue. When the Frenchmen arrived at Le Cap, the Haitians set the tone for the clash that was to come, as Leclerc attempted to diplomatically pressure Haitian commander Henri Christophe into surrendering the city. The locals responded by burning their own city, angering the French. But Leclerc had the goal of summoning Louverture to Le Cap, and thus sent him kind messages, including the following. Have no worries about your personal fortune. It will be safeguarded for you since it has been only too well earned by your own efforts. Do not worry about the liberty of your fellow citizens. Louverture, nevertheless, refused to obey the French, and thus, war broke out yet again. 
The Haitians quickly resorted to a scorched earth policy, with Louverture explaining to Jean-Jacques Dessalines that he hoped that those who have come to reduce us to slavery may have before their eyes the image of the hell which they deserve. One French general even described the scene left by the Haitians after classes, often resulting in the leaving out of French corpses to rot and hopefully to send shivers down the invaders' spines. The following couple of years would see the capture of Louverture and the continued fight for freedom between the Haitians and Napoleon's men. For the Haitians, this was a fight for their liberty and sovereignty, while for the French, it was all about control and the re-establishment of slavery to their own advantage. The result of the war would be in favor of the former. On January 1st, 1804, Saint-Domingue's current authority, Dessaine, declared Haitian independence as a free republic under the name already used by the local population, Haiti. The Haitian genocide followed, with the murder of nearly all remaining Blancs within the territory, and Dessaïn daringly stating that, for our declaration of independence, we should have the skin of a white man for parchment, his skull for an inkwell, his blood for ink, and a bayonet for a pen. But despite the immorality that remained high on the side of whoever had controlled Haiti over the past decades, the Haitian people had accomplished much. The Free Republic became the first of its kind in Latin America, and the only nation that won its independence through a successful slave rebellion. Though the revolution may have been marred by extreme brutality on both sides, as were the ways of the authority prior to and following, Haiti's independence was a remarkable accomplishment. And today, while all that has occurred in those years should be remembered, it's important not to forget the bravery and ambition that it took for freedom to shine its light on the Haitian people.